Today's video is a continuation on the evolution series. So topics will include fossil records, the geologic time scale, the history and origins of life on Earth, as well as primate evolution. So let's jump right into it. How fossils are formed. So a dinosaur collapses and dies, footprints are left behind in the mud, and over time the flesh will rot. So only the bones remain. And now the water level rises and the sediment buries the bones and the footprints. So the water brings in sediment, brings in sand and mud, and it covers the dinosaur bones. So now you get different types of sand, different minerals and stuff coming in, and eventually the dinosaur is embedded in a certain layer of rock, mud, gravel, sand. And then over time, um, you have erosion, which carves in a layer, or it carves through this hillside, and it exposes the dinosaur bones, and people discover it, and you can start your dig site. How fossils are formed. So there are six categories of fossil types. You have your trace fossils, which are pretty much anything that's left behind by the animal or the organism. So this might include tracks, burrows, nests, even feces. Anything but the organism itself. Next you have molds and casts. So a mold is an impression that's left behind by the organism, and a cast is a mold that's filled with the sediment, so it's like a 3D model. Which would kind of make it fall under this category as well, so a cast in some ways is a replacement because it's just the original material of the organism and it's replaced with mineral crystals. So sometimes you might have hollowed out bones that are filled with like sand and other types of rocks and minerals. So this actually leaves behind really detailed replicas of the organism. Now you have petrified or permineralized fossils. So the empty spaces in this tree trunk are filled with minerals. So this is known as petrified wood. So the outer bark is still preserved and the inside hollow parts have minerals pumped inside of them. Now you have amber, so this is when tree sap will trap an organism and it's preserved quite nicely. So there is a mosquito or some sort of insect that's inside of amber. And last but not least, you have mummies or freezing of an organism, so you have the original material itself. And this does quite a good job of keeping a record or evidence of things that used to live in the past. And these are known as fossils. Now we'll discuss how scientists are able to determine the age of really old things because you always hear on the news or you might read an article like scientists or archaeologists have found some fossils which they estimate to be 50,000 years old or 2 million years old. Well, how do they know exactly? Well, they use a technique called radiometric dating. So that means they compare the percentage of carbon-14, which is an isotope of carbon-12 and over time it will decay. So carbon-12 has six protons, six neutrons, and it's stable, but carbon-14 has six protons, eight neutrons, and its half-life is 5,730 years, which means every 5,730 years, the sample decays. Half of the sample decays. It just breaks down over time because it's unstable. So what you do is you compare the percentage of carbon-14 to the percentage of nitrogen-14. Now these are two isotopes that are consumed by the organism while it's alive. It gets it from its diet or maybe it's produced naturally. So after one half-life, if you dig up a set of bones or you find an organism that's just been sitting there and it has 50% of its carbon-14 remaining, you could say that the age of this organism is 5,730 years old. And subsequently, if you find that it has a ratio of 75% nitrogen-14 to only 25% carbon-14, you could say that two half-lives have passed because 5,730 plus 5,730 makes 11,460, so that means two half-lives. So that means every half-life, you just add an additional 5,730 years. 
and you put this organism through a machine and I'm sure they have all these special tools that can find the percentage of carbon-14 and nitrogen-14 and you can get pretty accurate readings on this so let's say you have 87.5 percent nitrogen and 12 and a half percent carbon-14 you could say now that another half-life has passed and this process will repeat it's got to be around I would say in eight or nine half-lives because it's good for around 50,000 years you can date something all the way back 50,000 years so that's what carbon-14 is good for now on the other hand you have uranium-238 which has a half-life of four and a half billion years so its long half-life suggests that the age of the earth is four and a half billion years old because that's when the earth was formed and it received all its materials and its isotopes and such cross-referencing using index fossils so this is just another tool that an archaeologist or a biologist could use to determine the age of rock layers so we'll discuss these three errors in just a moment the Cenozoic the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic error but um, let's talk about the logic behind the age of something so obviously the bottom most layer would contain the oldest fossils and the top layers are the newest because new sediment covers the organisms so let's say you find an organism buried somewhere here in the Silurian period you can then cross-reference that to fossils that you've already found and then determine its age or let's say where I put that X you find some new bone or fossil you can then cross-reference it to things you've already found in the tertiary and Cretaceous period and you can determine the age that way and again the the age of those fossils were determined using radiometric dating here is the geologic time scale which shows you what kinds of organisms lived in which uh, time periods so you have three errors it's known as the Cenozoic Mesozoic and Paleozoic remember the Greek root paleo means old so that's the oldest one so the bottom most layer is the oldest the top layer is the newest and now your errors can then be further divided into something called periods so for each error I'll just put a check mark next to it instead of reading them through because you can just see for yourself on the screen each error has its own periods okay? they don't all have the same number of periods it's all divided differently and this time scale goes all the way back 600 million years so quite old that's when advanced organisms first appeared on earth so you have your periods which are then further divided into something called epics okay so again just think of it like units of time like hours minutes and seconds except this is on a much larger scale because the earth has been around for like four and a half billion years so over here the boxes that I'm drawing over here in green these are like your plant-like fungus-like organisms and you can see how they advance through the errors in the Paleozoic era you have like these ancient primitive looking spores and fungus then you have your ferns and then your flowers now over here in red we have our primitive organisms things like reptiles and fish and mollusks and insects they've been around forever so they span nearly 400 million years on the time scale then you have your age of dinosaurs in the Mesozoic era and finally you have your mammals and human beings so we're very recent okay so on the left in the red boxes you have your animals and then on the right you have your plant-like organisms so relatively speaking humans have been around very short okay just the last two and a half million years and each error is marked by a mass extinction which allows for the succession of life so new organisms will then roll in so you can see this advancement or this progress this evolution over time 
origins of life on Earth. So it's speculated that Earth was very different billions of years ago. You have really hot conditions, meteors, asteroids crashing in. There's no atmosphere to protect it from UV rays. You didn't have water. Conditions were dry and it was not suitable for life. So Earth was extremely hot 700 million years ago and you couldn't really get an atmosphere to form until temperatures cooled down. So um, at first the atmosphere had no oxygen and again if you have no oxygen you can't perform cellular respiration so it can't support life or advanced organisms. But as temperatures cooled down you get water vapor to condense and it falls as rain and now you have oceans and once you have oceans you can then form organic compounds because water is a really good solvent. And so organic compounds can be made from inorganic things. So again you see that picture there that's an artist's rendition of what early earth conditions were like. You see the same picture here again on the right side. So one of the most important experiments that helped explain the origins of life was the Miller-Urey experiment in 1953. So they demonstrated that organic compounds could be made by simulating conditions of early earth. So the picture again, you have lightning, thunderstorms, volcanic eruptions, a very weak atmosphere where UV can seep in, but at least you have water and you have oceans. So that's a good starting point. So you have all these chemicals here, methane, which is being released by hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean, water, carbon dioxide, and then hydrogen cyanide. And if you have those chemicals, you can actually build amino acids. And if you have amino acids, you can make polymers or protein chains. So if you have proteins, you can then support life because proteins can carry out chemical functions. So here's their experimental setup. You have all this glassware being connected and you heat up water. The water vapor will then act as a solvent, which can then bring together methane, ammonia, and hydrogen gas. And you zap it with electricity, which simulates the lightning. And then there's a condenser and you cool it down. And now you get this soup. It's called primordial soup. Okay, And this soup has organic stuff in it, things that can support life. Maybe it's lipids, maybe it's sugar. Maybe it's proteins, but those are the things that life needs in order to support itself. The other thing is called the meteorite hypothesis. Okay, so this is the idea that meteorites and asteroids um, came crashing into Earth and it carried life with it, or it had organic molecules. Maybe it was carrying proteins from some outer world. Who knows? And now we have something called the early cell structure hypothesis. Okay, so iron sulfide, which are released um, by hydrothermal vents, are things that um, can help support cell structure. Okay, iron sulfide is a chemical that's found in cells. Okay, and so in these very extreme conditions where there's no sunlight and oxygen, life was still able to form. And Here's a lipid membrane hypothesis. So again, you need a cell membrane to support life and um, to keep your cells protected. So lipid molecules can actually form and um, these were the first cell-like structures that you start to see. Now we have RNA as early genetic material. Okay, so RNA was believed to be the original genetic material because it could self-replicate, it can make copies of itself. You have these photosynthetic critters, these cyanobacteria, which um, would release oxygen in the process of performing photosynthesis. And this is how you change the atmosphere or you improve the atmosphere. So now that you have higher levels of oxygen, this allowed um, the evolution of aerobic prokaryotes. If you have oxygen, now you can perform uh, cellular respiration. So you become more and more advanced. 
Now, there's a theory called the endosymbiosis theory, and it's a theory that a larger cell engulfed a bacterium, and this bacterium can produce energy. So it's endosymbiosis because one organism lives within the body of another, and they both benefit from the relationship. So the bacteria can produce energy for this larger cell, and the larger cell can protect it because it has a cell wall, maybe it's a cell membrane. So they both benefit from each other, and it's thought that this bacteria would later become mitochondria because it can produce its own energy. So mitochondria and chloroplasts were just once simple prokaryotic cells, and they were just taken up by larger prokaryotes. Okay, and so it's almost like an organelle within an organelle now, nowadays. Okay, but in the past, it was thought that these two energy-producing things had their own DNA and their own ribosomes, and they could perform their own work and support themselves. But they just decided to pair up with a larger cell to get protection. You also have the evolution of sexual reproduction, because at first, you have prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which only produced asexually, which means they butt off and they create clones of themselves, almost like mitosis. But if you have more advanced sexual reproduction, you have more diversity, more diversity, more genes, okay, and evolution can occur that way. Now we can discuss primate evolution. So it's thought that humans share a common ancestor with other primates, and primates are basically species of animals that have flexible hands and feet, they have forward-facing eyes, and they have big brains compared to their bodies. So big brains, high IQ. Now, the oldest living primate group is known as the prosimians. So these guys weren't so human-like, they're more ape-like and rodent-like, but we could trace prosimians and human beings back 60 million years to a common ancestor. And all these different species here, gorillas, chimpanzees, the old world monkeys, you can trace it back to a common ancestor that was shared with the prosimians. So you have your anthropoids, which include your old world and new world monkeys. These are human-like primates. Then you have your hominoids, and you have your hominids, which would be the human beings there. So again, common ancestor, you can trace it back where you have those nodes intersecting and converging. That indicates a common ancestor. So our most closely related relative is the chimpanzee because we share a common ancestor with them dating back five to 10 million years. So the closer these convergence points, that means the more closely related or similar you are. So human beings, aren't very similar to prosimians, but they're very similar to chimpanzees in that we form social structures. Now, apes, primates, also became bipedal. So that means you're two-legged and you walk upright, and this obviously leads to evolutionary success. You can move around, you become nomadic, you can hunt, you can farm, you could use tools, and this is all based off fossil evidence. Just looking at it, you can look at the hip structure and the spine structure, and you could see that probably this organism walked upright. Now you have Homo habilis, which is two and a half to 1.5 million years ago. It's a species of hominid. So this was known as a handyman because now this guy can start using crude stone tools. 200,000 to 30,000 years ago, you have your Homo neanderthals. So this would be like your cavemen. And cavemen had a sense of religion. They would bury their dead, apparently. They had social structure. They had families. They could form campfires. They had shelter. And you had your family units, right? You had mom taking care of her child, and then you have dad there. And now we have Homo sapiens. So this is the modern man. This guy is capable of hunting, using tools, forming families, banding together with other groups of humans. 
So modern humans arose about 100,000 years ago, and the origins are from Ethiopia. Okay, obviously you have dig sites and archaeologists finding remnants of these societies, and human evolution was influenced by culture. So tools right, are key markers in human evolution. You can look at the types of tools that people used and see their advancement, their technology. We'll discuss strictly hominid evolution. So not the primates, not prosimians and chimpanzees and gorillas, but strictly just hominids, which are human-like species. So you have your Australopithecines dating back two to three million years ago. And I want you to observe two things, the jaw size and the size of the skull. So it's thought that primitive species of hominids needed big jaws to gnaw at food. Okay, to chomp on like vegetables and meat. But as time progresses, your Homo sapiens, your modern man, they have big skulls, or we have big skulls, and a small jawline. And obviously you have other primitive species like Homo erectus, and we'll compare the sizes of their brains in just a moment here. But you also have Homo habilis, so these were the handymen, or the, the species that knew how to use tools, stone tools. So if we list their brain sizes here in order, you have your Australopithecines, which have a brain size of 400 cubic centimeters, cc, followed by Homo habilis at 700, Homo erectus is 800, and then the modern human has a 1,000 cubic centimeter size brain. So obviously the implications here are if you have a bigger skull, you can accommodate a bigger brain. Bigger brain, higher IQ, higher IQ, more technology. More technology means more advancements in science, medicine, farming, literature, just overall skills. We covered quite a bit on fossils, the geologic time scale, the history and origins of life on Earth, as well as primate and hominid evolution. I hope you found this series informative. Make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Wind Biology.